Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing super good. Super good. Super stupendous. I have a I have a fun thing I was thinking about today. Oh yeah? Yeah. What is it? And I'm gonna talk to my resident system scientist expert type. All right, you ready for it? Drum roll is? Yeah. Networks. Oh. They're everywhere. Network theory. I was thinking about it. Think about social networks, terrorist networks, yep. ecological networks. There's just networks. There's a lot of them. A lot of networks. Yeah. And I think it's important that we understand that there are networks all around us, what they are, why they're important, how they relate to systems thinking. Yeah. So just go on, well, just riff on networks. No, I mean, I think a lot of people know the English word network. Networks, they don't know yeah. like the theory behind networks and what networks why they're meaningful to our daily life and our thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think most people know what networking is, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, and they know why it's important. I think most people understand the internet work, right? The World <laughs> Wide Webs. And, uh, you know, they understand, like, are you in network with your, with your health provider care. or care provider? Um, there's friendship networks. Like you said, there's terrorist networks. There's... Your family is a network uh, of interconnections. Your, you know, there's all all ecologies, ecological systems are networks. Um, there's molecular networks. There's yeah, but at their base, they're just a network everywhere. is things that are connected. Yeah, at its base, a network is made up of of two things, uh, uh, sometimes called nodes and edges. And uh, but you could just think of them as dots and connections, you know, like little dots and little lines, connections. Yeah, that's basically what it was. It, network theory is the underlying sort of theoretical structure, or sometimes in mathematics it's called graph theory. But uh, it was actually created, uh, I think, in the 16th century or 18th century. Uh, I'm getting the century wrong, but um, by a guy named Leonid Euler who uh, in, in Konigsberg, Prussia. Yeah. So in Konigsberg, there was a river and it kind of went like this and then like this. So that's the river. And the city was perched alongside the river. So you can imagine that this is kind of the city. All this stuff is the buildings and stuff like that and more mm -hmm. buildings over here. Right. And like, you know, sh stores and houses and then some buildings here and some buildings here. Right. Right. So you can imagine this is a big river. It's kind of. Yeah. Much bigger than but that. But it's broken about it's broken land up into a bunch of kind of pieces. Yeah. And this is this is like a, you know, a thick river, not like, like a str a significant river. Right. Yeah. There were bridges. Right. There is a bridge here. So here's a bridge, and here's a bridge, and here's a bridge, and here's a bridge. And then there was like a bridge here, and then a bridge, uh, I think, here and here, right? Yeah, and pe what people wondered at the time, you know, because they had a lot of time on their hands, was, uh, <laughs> yeah. was could you kind of get to all the land masses, so one, two, three, four land masses, basically, by only crossing each bridge once. I mean, you didn't have to overlap the going back on the bridge, right? And people just wondered that because they were walking around. They had time on their hands to wonder things. They had to wonder about those things. <laughs> and Euler basically sat down. He's a mathematician and kind of a, a system-y guy. And he sat down to figure out whether whether that was true or false, whether you could do it or couldn't, uh, it turns out you can't. But you in the can't cannot. You yeah. cannot. Okay. You cannot. You can't. You can't hit all the land masses um, without crossing a bridge tw more than once. Interesting. So, but in the process, uh, this is the amazing part. In the in the process of him figuring out this little riddle, he invented network theory. Just invented it. Yep. He invented <laughs> network theory. And the way he did it was he just did this ingenious little abstraction in a sense, right? So what he did was he said, 
if we make the land masses, you know, a node or a dot, and then we make the bridges relationships, you you basically can figure out the the problem because it's he just abstracted the problem. So he basically with with essentially just dots yep. and lines or connections, he discovered network theory, which is one of the most powerful theories we have. Um, it's at the base of like every every single thing that you use on yeah. here and yeah. our phones and, and meaning you can take a whole bunch of complexity mm -hmm. and reduce it to what you're calling nodes and edges or yeah. dots and lines dots and lines and when you make that abstraction then you can see it differently yeah really important why is it important well the first thing that the first thing that's important about it is is all the wildly important applications of it right like i mean it 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 captures reality, right? When when we do these things, it captures reality. It solves problems in reality, right? So the the pragmatic application of it is is very important. Um, the other thing that I think is deeply important, and probably one of the things that people um, surprisingly, one of the things that I've found in in the last thirty years is the most difficult thing that people have in navigating complexity. Which is surprising. Like I would never, if you had asked me 30 years ago, is that the thing that's going to get in people's way? I never would have said it. Really? Yeah. Interesting. It's the idea that when we're dealing with really, really complex and overwhelming situations or stuff, that the solution to it could be simple. I see. Because we just do not, we, we think of simple and complex as opposites. Right. If something is complex, we don't think oh, you know, I've got to see the simplicity that underlies it. Under yeah, I understand. So we don't see simplicity and complexity as being like two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. or sister acts in a process. We just don't see the connection. But ironically, the study of complexity, uh, which is, you know, uh, started with people like pre eugene but uh, was pioneered at, at places like the Santa Fe Institute, the study of complexity really is about both simplicity and complexity, which, again, when right. people first hear that, they're, they're going to be like, what? Why is that? Yeah. But um, Murray Gelman, who was at the Santa Fe Institute and who, um, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, you know, his work in quantum physics and things like that, uh, he discovered the quark. Um, wrote a great book called um, Quark and the Jaguar. Quark. He wrote a paper that was like two pages long. It's a great paper. It's one Hard. of my favorite papers. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to write a short paper. In that paper, he he called he's he, the name of the paper was let's call it Plectix. Mm -hmm. And what he meant was let's call the field this emerging field of complexity, which has you know overtaken most of science. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. It's influenced science just dramatically. Yeah. What he meant was, let's call the field of complexity plectics. Let's not call it complexity theory See? or yeah. complexity. Uh, let's call it plectics. And um, he was lamenting about how probably it would not be picked up as the name. Uh, and it wasn't. Yeah. It was. It's a paper that's been mostly lost to history. But it. But it's a brilliant paper. It's two pages long. Anybody could read it. You can just search. Let's call it Plectics. Um, but it was about the fact that the 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 portion of the word complexity, the plex, mm -hmm. and the portion of the word pl um, in simple, mm -hmm. simpler. Mm -hmm. And if we think of the word simple as simplex, yeah, right, yeah. If you have simplex and complex, that part of the word is actually the same. So even in the word yes. simple and complex, they have a common part, which is this root plek, right? Which is p l e k, yeah. And plek literally means kind of once or multi braided, so it can be part of simplex, which is just the one like braid. Right. Or complex, which is like the tapestry of, 
of bla- of bla- of uh, braids, braids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and you realize, oh well, yeah, that that one weave over here is just multiplied to get the tapestry, you know, some beautiful carpet or something like that. Seeing the simple inside of the complex, like the the relationship between them. Yes, seeing that underneath complexity is simplicity. That that complex adaptive systems have simple rules underneath. And um, and that's just bewildering to a lot of folks. Like, why would something that's complex be simple underneath? Mm. Um, but what Murray Galman was saying was that these two things are like sister acts. They're like two sides of the same coin. And that that even in our language, they are actually deeply related. That complexity and simplicity have this really remarkable relationship. And so, nature finds a way of making things, you know, simple underneath. Yes. But I think maybe what you're implying from the paper is that by naming it complexity, we're missing the richness of the idea of complexity and simple underneath. Like, here was complexity for Euler, but like he's risen the simples he's, he, underneath it. He saw the, the simplicity underneath and that that made all the difference. And and he saw underneath. It's almost like think about it like a like a an iceberg. You know, you, we see just the top of the iceberg, but underneath is something much m- more important or bigger. Yeah. And if we look at the underlying structure, so that was another reason why it's so powerful. Is think about all those networks that we listed at the beginning of this. You know, yeah. terrorist network, family, you know, friendship networks. So, you know, ecologies, ecologies, and you just keep going. Internets, computers, yeah. g- the electrical grid, you know, airline traffic, you name it. I- at every level of scale, we have networks, right? And yet, and so all the content, all the informational content of those networks couldn't be more different, right? right. I mean, yeah. terrorists are not your family, right? Right. Those are totally different content, informational content. Uh, an ecological network, the content of that network is not the same as a computer network. Right. And yet they have the same underlying structure. Yes, yeah, so you're saying they're all made up of dots and lines, nodes and edges. Yep. And I think part of what you're talking about why we need to know this or how that's useful is you imagine, you know, you, you've seen on TV shows and stuff the the huge like boards of this is connected to that is connected to that and then you have to almost not see the informational content and just see this structure to see well where's a, a relationship i could leverage in right. out of this like yes. you were saying um a while ago terrorist network sometimes it's where there's not a connection between that 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 we you can exploit Absolutely. Like, but there's not a connection between two things rather than just that there is. That's right. Yeah. So if we think about the the pattern of, of organization, mm-hmm. the a DSRP, you know, is, is not, what is and is not something. Well, you can apply that to the pattern of relationships of action, reaction. So we can put those two together and we can say what what is and is not related. Right. It turns out that in networks, what is not related is as important as how things are related, right? How things are not related is as important as how they are related. And in the case of terrorist networks, that's really important because you could you could leverage that non-relationship. Um, you know, you can you can, think of it this way: like if if you, a kid knows that mom and dad haven't talked. Mm-hmm. Well, he can manipulate mom and manipulate dad for to get something, well, you know, because classic. he knows he knows that connection didn't exist, right? Well, it's the classic dad said I could. <laughs> or mom already gave me permission to Right. Do it. So it's like you talk to mom, you talk you so it's relationship <laughs> with mom, relationship with dad. Don't let them and then like make it happen before they get to talking, right? So that's, that's right. just manipulating non relationships. That's right. That's yeah. right. You were talking about the surface level and that we get, you know, we get bogged down by the complexity of all the stuff at the surface, the informational content. And I wonder if one of the pitfalls, when we say networks in sort of just popular language, I think people think of a bunch of stuff that's connected, but they mostly think about the stuff, 
right? They don't think about the the connections as much. That's right. Yeah, I think when we think about if we if we so if we think if we reduce this network or any network, any any level of complexity, it could be as complex as you want it to be. But if we can re- reduce it down to, you know, dots mm-hmm. and and connections, right? So we, you've got dots and you've got connections, right? And when we say the term connect the dots. Oh, yeah. Right? Connect the dots. What we're talking about fundamentally is is seeing the connections between the dots. And, right. and I would say like a huge part of almost all the problems that we're having today writ large is because we're not connecting the dots. And that doesn't just mean making the connections. It, it also means understanding the dots. Right. Right. So you have to understand the dots at a deep level and you have to understand the connections at a deep level. And and you have to make sure that all the dots are connected. I think this is one of the biggest problems in science writ large. I think it's one of the biggest problems in society writ large is that we're not helping. We're not seeing that these systems are connected. We're seeing that, you know, a drug, you take a drug a, you know, pharmaceutical drug, and mm-hmm. it it does, in fact, cure this thing, or it does, in fact, decrease this thing or increase this thing, right? Yeah. But what we don't do is realize that when it's when it's decreasing or increasing that thing, yeah, it's also doing ten other things that we didn't test, right. And some of those things can be quite negative. Right, yeah. so that's an example of not connecting the dots, and then we have to recall that that drug or something like that because we realize, oh yeah, this does decrease pain, but it also, you know, complete, yeah. it creates you know uh, decades of uh, of addiction. Well, and it doesn't it doesn't reflect reality if you don't include the relationships between among things. You think about things like your own personal health and well being. It's the connection between your sleep, your right. hydration, your exercise, the 12 your minutes. stress level, yeah. right? So it's not, and and you can say, if you remove any one of those dots, the others are going to notice. Yeah. It, there's going to be an effect there's to other be. things, um, but we don't always um, we don't always focus on making sure they're all co- that we have accounted for that connection That's right. in the system. So so you're seeing the actual reality of it is, which is there are many things that are parts of a problem. Yeah. And if you just see the things and not the connections among them or the dynamics, you're going to miss a lot. And that's often what we do. We see the things in our, for example, in science, you know, and this is why things like interdisciplinarity and this is why complexity as a, as a science has emerged as very important and this is why networks is so important is because it it allows us to take these disciplines which are like departments the disciplines are like departments of a of a company right so if you think of a company breaks things down into departments yeah. the parts like right very, Ments. yeah and so that breaks things down into departments well we break knowledge of the universe of, down into disciplines mm-hmm. and when we break the organization down into parts, departments. And when we break the universe down into disciplines. parts, disciplines, we break, what are we breaking? We're breaking the relationships. Mm-hmm. We're breaking the relationships. And we forget to rebuild the relationships between the parts, between the departments, right? Yeah. Between the disciplines. And then we teach the young, for example, in school, we break the disciplines into periods and the kids learn math and they learn English and they learn, you know. And they all seem separate. And they all are separate. (laughs) Yeah. Right? And so then when we say, you know, oh, well, you know, math is important. Well, what's it important for? It's important for everything. It's important for, you know, it's important for PE. Yeah. It's important for... English, it's important for all kinds of things. And English is important to, you know, history and whatever, right? But all these different topics feed on each other Yeah. in reality. Yes. But we're not teaching them in that way. We're not connecting the dots. 
right? And when I, in science, the reason science sometimes fails is because we're not connecting the dots. Yeah. And in organizations, the reason we get silos yeah. is because we're not connecting the dots. Yes. Right? And you think about what you were saying about science. I, I remember, you know, going through the doctoral research process. It was all about the variables. Mm-hmm. Like, what are the variables? And then the the crux of the research was testing the relationship between and among some subset of the variables mm-hmm. and how they had an effect. That's right. right. But you can imagine if you just thought about the variables and not how they all interacted, so yeah, no, that, would, that would be bad. You would get nowhere well, with it. Yeah, and the world's in a very interconnected place. It's not that everything is connected to everything else. That's, that's People say that a lot, like everything's connected. Everything is not connected. Everything is eventually interconnected, but everything is not connected. There are lots of connections that don't exist between parts. Really? Yeah, it's kind of a it's like a wives' tale of that people use all that I hear it all the time. I'm like, oh well, everything's connected. No, nope. everything's definitely not connected, and nor would you want it to be. I mean, yeah. For example, if every neuron in your brain was connected to every other neuron in the brain, if there was a direct connection between every neuron in your brain to every other neuron, you'd be instantly insane. Yeah, you'd be overwhelmed. Yeah, and so we don't want that. We don't want. In fact, there's tremendous e- efficiencies in networks because everything is not perfectly connected to everything else. Right. There's there's real uh, there's real value in that. So we don't want every single thing to be connected to everything else. And and the universe doesn't make everything connected. Yeah. Now that's different than, you know. This thing might be seen far away from that other thing, but with if in five hops, I could yeah. be there. Yeah. I could get from this thing to that thing. Yes, that's everything's interconnected in that Absolutely way. The difference, yeah. But it, but it's not literally that everything's connected. I mean, there's not a one to one connection between every single thing and every other thing. Yeah, there that would be sort of that would be a webs. tremendously ineffective and inefficient. Yeah. Well, and it would be over. Yeah, it would be, be overwhelming. You wouldn't be able to process it all. Yeah, it would be too, too much. much. Well, so what's interesting is we have talked many times about uh, one of our, I want, I guess I'll say weaknesses in mm-hmm. how we think is that we don't, we don't see the connections. We're not really good at thinking about the relationships between and among things, right? And our, and I guess what I'm wondering is, are you saying that? Euler in creating network theory is sort of the first person to say, hey, you should put focus on both, or how would you contextualize that? Well, he was certainly a, he was certainly kind of a system-y guy. I don't think they had terms like systems thinking or system science then. Uh, but you know, he was he was thinking systemically. Yeah. Um, and like like we were saying, uh, there's tremendous value in what he did. Because of the application, because of connecting the dots, because of the universal sort of structures that underlie Mm -hmm. an infinite variety of things, um, because of the connection between complex complexity and simplicity, Mm -hmm. those are all values of of what he did. And network theory is is just remarkably powerful and useful today in every field. Yeah, because of what. Euler got right. Yes, but there's a couple things he got wrong. Yeah, that's uh, or didn't didn't it's see. Complete. Yeah, the, the, there's a few things he didn't see that you know, in the same way that network theory ha- is is literally at the cutting edge of where we are today. I mean, it's driving AI. It's driving yeah. all kinds of of the most advanced uh, cutting bleeding edge kind of things. Yeah. So, you know, kudos to. Euler, I mean, just yeah. total stud, right? Like, um, so interesting. <laughs> if I, he was, he, yeah, just amazing. But the future, I think, beyond where we are at today, beyond the bleeding edge, is is going to be uh, informed by some of the things that I think he missed about this abstraction. Mm-hmm. Every one of these dots in a network, yeah, is capable of not just being a dot, but being a whole. Yes. Which means that it can have a whole network inside of it. Okay. Right? So every one of these dots can be its own network, right? Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Meaning every one of those dots 
can be a whole that has many, many interconnected parts, right? Yes. This episode is sponsored by Training Camp, the ultimate online spot for building the mental fitness that drives personal and professional change and success. At Training Camp, you'll have access to the science and practice of thinking with personalized thinking assessments, tiered training, and best of all, practice that improves skill. Go to cabrerlab.org to learn more. And now, back to the episode. Also, Euler kind of abstracted the relationship as being a thing that is of the two things it's relating. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So the relationship without those two things that it's relating is effectively non-existent. But if we actually kind of zoom into what the real world reality situation on the ground was, those relationships are bridges. Yes. Right? Well, a bridge, you know, like let's say there's a bridge and it's got this little railing and, you know, Mm -hmm. some nice little bridge and whatever. It's got tread and, you know, thickness and stuff like that, right? And it's got water flowing underneath it. Yep. And then it's got these these land masses, right? This is a land mass and this is a land mask, right? Yeah. So it's connecting the, the, the land masses. But imagine we could, you know, not in this century, but in the, in the current century, we could come down and hook it up to a helicopter and we could take this bridge with cables and we could remove it. In that moment, that bridge is a thing. Yes. In other words, it's a, it's a dot. Yes. And we could, we could fly it over and stick it in a parking lot. Good. And it could just sit in a parking lot yeah. and it could exist without connecting anything. It could just exist as a bridge. Yes. And by the way, you know, that bridge is made up of parts. So it's a whole system, a networked system in and of itself, which means that even these relationships could be thought of as nodes. And those nodes, like these nodes, can be whole part, whole systems. Because there's parts to a bridge. There's yes. the railing, there's the tread, yes. there's the angle, there's all, all kinds, kinds of, of parts. things. And relationships between all those parts that hold the bridge together. Right. So you're doing a whole fractal yeah. level across scale. So what? So these things have material weight because they're the things. But yeah. then you're saying the relationships have that same material weight. Yeah. The relationships are essentially... Even if it wasn't a physical bridge. Even if it wasn't a physical bridge. And in fact, r- remarkably, the bridge is connected. There needs to be a connection here and here mm-hmm. between the land and the bridge. So there's even the bridge is connected to the land. Mm-hmm. And each side of the bridge is, has connections. So if you zoomed in, you would see another whole connected network that connects the bridge to the land, like big bolts or big cables or you know all, a whole system connecting that. And no matter how far you zoom in, you would have material structure that is connective and connecting. Yes, yes. So that's another thing that we have to look at is that these networks, the relationships aren't just these, uh, they're, they can be distinctly different things yes. that are whole systems. Okay, interesting. The other thing that we have to look at is that the each one of the dots, which includes these dots now, plus all the dots that could be the relationships, right? Yeah. Not only are those part whole systems that you could zoom into, those dots are places or points of view that you could view the network from. So we could look at the network from this dot's perspective. Right. Or we could look at the network from this dot's perspective. And they see different And you would see different stuff. That What that means is that this dot is the looker, like what we call the point. Yeah. And at that moment, all these dots are the view, let's say. Yeah. And and then when we shift the point, then now this dot is the looker and all these dots are the view. So bo- so all the dots and, and relationships, the connections, mm-hmm. are both point and view. So what, you, what you're basically saying is that DSRP is an extension of network yes. theory or... Yeah. Uh, I guess extension is the best word. It is. It's sort of adding. It's taking that word theory and adding on to it. So he came up with some simple rules for what led to the complexity that emerges from those simple rules. And what DSRP does is just add 
some of the simple rules that account for the actual complexity that we see. Interesting. Right? So when we see the complexity of conflict and things like that, well, that that has to do with, you know, different perspectives on the network, right? Mm-hmm. That, that So one, one group is seeing things one way, seeing the network one way, and another group is seeing the network the other way. And so there's more than just dots and connections. There's that these dots and connections are looking at each other in different ways. And uh, and, the, and again, the connections are not just formed as a result of being connective. They're, they're things in and of themselves. And so when you, I mean, it's, it's a saying people, you know, say, oh, you got to connect the dots. Yeah. I mean, that has more meaning really than it sounds when people say. For sure. Yeah, it's not just literally see the connections i think it's it's see it's see the connections it's mm-hmm. see that the connections are are material things that we can zoom into it's zooming into the dots so we want to zoom into the dots we want to zoom into the connections mm-hmm. we want to see the connections we want to see that the connections are dots we want to see that every dot which includes dots and connections mm-hmm. uh, is a both a point and a view. So in other words, it's it's a point that you can look from, but it's also a view that multiple points are looking at. It's part of the view that multiple points are looking at. So it's it's very much like what we do in social dynamics, right? If 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 we're sitting at a table mm-hmm. and and I see that she's looking at her when she's looking at me and He's looking at her, you know, and, and you're like, oh, I, she's noticing her, right? You're taking account of the point and the view. Oh, but she's not noticing this, right? That's not in her view. She's not aware of that, right? right? So you're you're sort of building that node's point of view on the system, even at the same time that you're building your own point of view, which is unaware of other certain parts of the system, Right. And so we're doing this constantly. We're doing this level of networking, network theory, right? DSRP, yeah. yeah, all the time. We're just not aware of it, right? And the more aware of it that we are, the more aware of nature doing it we can be. The more aware of the dynamics, the more aware of what's going on, the complexity. Well, and that awareness matters in terms of what we always talk about: seeing reality, loving reality. I mean, the reality is. This is how things exist, yep. right? It's not just a bunch of stuff that's not related. It's not that everything's related, but there are there are salient relationships that impact, you know, what's happening in the real world that you need to be paying attention to. For sure. Right. And obviously perspectives inside and, and sort of on the systems that you're thinking about. Absolutely. So I think, you know, this has been really interesting and you've drawn these cool graphics. And and you've you've talked a lot about sort of the the theory and Euler and the science behind it. I guess I I would be wondering, well, how does this really impact me in my day to day life? Like, why would I? I mean, it's interesting to listen to, but how is it useful to me in my day to day life as I go about everything I'm doing? Like, why would I be paying attention to it? When you understand DSRP and networks. Mm-hmm. the network the 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 DSRP like networks that we're surrounded by yeah it allows you to embrace the actual complexity that is in front of you mm-hmm. whether that complexity is in you know a situation that your children are in or your family is in or a situation that you're experiencing at work or your concern for the politics of the country or you know you're trying to Think about why is there so much homelessness or why is there so much, you know, yeah. mental health issues or why are there some wires, you know, like any take any problem that you're concerned about, whether it be a very small problem yeah. like in your family, but a big and important one mm-hmm. or whether it be at work, whether it be personal or professional, whether it be kind of an everyday problem, a local problem or a global problem. Like a big, big problem. Yeah. Like it doesn't really matter what problem it is. It's complex. Yeah. The problem is complex, you know? Yeah. Um, 
it, if it involves people, it for sure is complex. Yeah. And if it involves people and machines and, you know, society and all kinds of other things that people interact with, it's for sure complex. Mm -hmm. Or even if you, maybe you're not trying to solve a problem. Maybe you're trying to understand sports. Yeah. You know, or maybe you're trying to understand a, a, the, the different points somebody's making in a book you're reading. Like, it doesn't have to be like a problem or issue. Like, anything that you're trying to suss out that's complex, and most of the things that we're dealing with are complex. Yeah. Most of the things we care about are complex. Most of the things we are dealing with are complex. And a lot of times, that complexity can feel overwhelming. Yes. It can feel like, I don't know which way's up. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to understand this. Yeah. I wish I understood that. You know, whatever whatever your reaction is to it. These tools and understanding DSRP and networks and being able to visualize them and draw them out and things like that, they allow you to cut through that complexity without without losing the richness of it, right? Yeah. Einstein said, everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. <laughs> yeah. And so we don't we don't want to take a complex system and make it like oversimplified, right? Yeah. That's different than there are simple rules that when multiplied lead to this thing being the way it is. That's different than I'm going to take something really complex and like create this straw man version of it that is oversimplified. Yeah. So I think what it does is it it gives you tools mm -hmm. to adapt and learn and be uh, not overwhelmed by the complexity that's in front of you, regardless of what that complexity is. Yeah, and I think one of the things you said earlier that I think is is a good way to think about it is when you have the ability to think about the underlying structure, you're not as distracted by the content. You can get to sort of the, yes. the nature of the problem uh, differently. And then that gives you some footing into understanding the complexity of all of the people and the variables and all of that. Yeah, that, I'm glad you brought that point up because it, the, 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 I, I probably would have forgotten that. But, but it's actually probably one of the most important points is that, you know, when we, when we deal with people that are, when we're helping people, you know, deal with the complexity that they deal with in their work lives or their businesses yeah. or their organizations or their, or their lives. Um, I would say that one of the number one things that they get stuck by is the information. They get yeah. stuck in the, in the sheer overwhelming amount of information. Yeah. And they can't sort of see the underlying structure, right? Mm -hmm. The underlying structure which the information is, is important. I'm not saying the information isn't important, but the information isn't the only thing. Underneath the information is the structure. Yes. And the structure can tell you a lot about the system. Yes. And so if you can't see that underlying structure, the underlying DSRP structure of it, the underlying dots and lines and yeah. dot lines and yeah, yeah. perspective dots and view dots and, you know, zooming into the dots to see more dots of, of connected mm -hmm. nature, um, then, then, then you miss, you just get overwhelmed by the information. You just, you, you are indecisive. You don't know what to do. You don't know what decision to make. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, all of this comes down to like, Either uh, you want to understand something, you want to make a decision, you want to be successful, you want to have some change occur. All of that depends on what your mental model is of the reality of the situation. Yes. And the reality of the situation is often complex. Um, and so this helps you cut through the complexity and find the underlying sort of structure so that you can understand why things are complex the way they are. I mean, I know that when I'm overwhelmed and I've had, you know, I'm in the area of policy with you in mm -hmm. at Cornell and somebody says to me, somebody said to me literally the other day, how are we going to solve housing policy? And, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, gee, I don't know. Like, that's a lot. So then when you map out all of the information involved in housing policy, 
it's a lot. And then it, you have to step back and say, okay, well, how is this organized? What's the structure? Like, where are the distinctions that matter? Where are the relationships that we're not seeing or we are seeing? And to me, it, that this seeing the underlying structure gives you that, it's like a footing mm -hmm. into not only seeing the way it's structured in reality, but it gives you a way to better understand an overwhelmingly a, a large amount of information because you can organize it That's right. based on the structures. And then you get a... Yeah, and where are the incentives that are altering different perspectives yeah. on the system, right? Exactly. So, you know, I'm going to behave a certain way as an agent in the system, as one of the nodes in the system. I'm going to behave a certain way based on mm -hmm. certain incentives or anti-incentives, you know, or something like that. And then and then we multiply that times everybody in the system and yeah. you get, oh, wow, that's interesting that, that we're seeing these macro-level behaviors because of these micro-level interactions. Yes. Right? So we we start to see that the macro, I think one of the things that people really confuse a lot with complex adaptive systems, which which are the ones that we all live in and, mm -hmm. and care about, are is a lot of times the macro behavior of the system, like that we don't like some behavior of the system that we're dealing with. And when I say system, I don't mean like you know, the system could be your marriage. The system could be your friendship with somebody. The system could be... How we take the trash out. How you take the <laughs> trash out of the system could be whether or not your customers are pleased or not. Yeah. Well, if if you realize, oh, my, our customers are not happy with something, well, that's an outcome. Mm -hmm. Right? You can't... You don't want to work directly on the outcome. You want to work on the on what are the what are the rules that are bringing about that emergent property? Yes, that that thing's already done. They're already unhappy. And sure, you can maybe go back and reactively fix some things for customers, right? But that's not fixing the system. That's fixing that one problem. Yeah. Right. So yeah. when people say they're putting out fires all the time, that's putting out fires. Right. But if you want fires not to keep continually starting mm -hmm. in multiple places at once, you've got to change the way the system is structured. Yep. And for that, you have to understand the structure of the system and you have to understand that that this system is actually creating unhappy customers. You, you, in other words, this isn't a byproduct, a, a, a mistake. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a result of the way the system is structured. Yes, meaning the outcome is the outcome of the system is the result of all the interactions of the stuff inside That's the right. system. So in order to change the outcome, you have to change the stuff inside the system. Yeah, there's a there's a term in, in systems called POSIWID, mm -hmm. which is just a big term. It's a it's an acronym. For the purpose of a system is what it does. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means is you know, if you if you have an educational system that's that isn't engaging, you might say, well, that's not the purpose of the system. The purpose of the system isn't to be not engaging. Mm -hmm. But the way the system is structured is it's it's not engaging. It's causing Should, that outcome. It, it's causing that outcome, right? The system is bringing about that emergent property of lack of engagement. Right. So there's something about the system that is, in a way, purposefully creating lack of engagement. Yeah. As a system. I'm not saying anybody in the system has the has the dastardly notion of like let's let's like run engagement <laughs> into the floor, you know, and and have all children be bored by school. Yeah. No. No but no individual in the system is saying that, but the collective system is bringing about the emergent property of lack of engagement. Right. Or the collective system is bringing about the emergent property of you know, yeah. customer dissatisfaction or whatever, yeah. right? Employee dissatisfaction. Right. And so what you have to do is say, well, what is it about the structure of the system that's bringing, that's, that's leading to that? That's bringing that emergent property out. Right. And let's change that structure, change some of the relationships, change some of the nodes, change some of the things that are inside the nodes. Yes. That's you know, change some of the perspectives, change some of the mental models that are driving those perspectives. And then you'll get a different result. And you'll get a different result. Because you've changed what's happening inside. And you're just not afraid of that level of complexity. That's what these tools give you, is that you don't have to be afraid of that level of complexity. I was talking to one of our grad students the other day, 
and he's and he's out in the world, you know, doing his thing, and he's doing uh, doing great. Tim, you know who I'm talking about. Shout uh, out to Tim. Uh, no, no, you so, are. And he said, you know, it just gives it just gives me it's like a superpower because I just can go into any room and I just you know no problem. I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of any level of complexity. I'm not afraid of things I don't know. I'm not afraid of really, really complex topics that I don't know. I just can go into any room and I've, I know I have the tools to kind of navigate the unknown, navigate complexity. And it was, it was great to hear that he's, you know, having that experience in the world. But that's what we want for every, everybody. for everybody, for every kid is, uh, in, uh, you know, every person that, um, that they can just have that confidence of like, doesn't really matter how complex it is. I can navigate it. I yeah. I've got the tools because to I navigate. Know to think it. about it. I know how to think it through. And yes, I can see the underlying structure. I can get. So that's what it gives you. That's what that's all it gives you. It gives you that the confidence and the tools to just kind of, you know, you can imagine if a plumber comes to your house, you're sitting there going, "Oh my god, the this is a mess. I don't know what's going on. Everything's clogged and blah blah blah." And there's you know, smells and different <laughs> things and total chaos. And, the, you know, the plumber's like, okay, well, you know, he's got the tools and he's got the yeah, awareness of, yeah. of how to fix that problem. So he's not, he's not walking in going, oh, I'm terrified of this problem. He's walking in going, this is fixable. Yeah. Well, this is giving you the tools and in many ways, the confidence, the skills, the techniques to navigate any, any, Com any level of complexity, any problem, any issue, any understanding. That's good. That's, that's pretty cool. That's an important. Yeah. Is that, uh, do, does that answer the, the does that the answer question. the call? You did, you did me proud. Sure. My systems expert. Networks. Yes. Yeah. I guess that's a wrap then. That's a wrap. Oh, wait, we're back. <laughs> what are you wearing? What do you mean, what am I wearing? What is it's that? It's my special holiday crown. Holiday crown. Yes. It's, it's time to be festive. It's time to start thinking about celebrating the end of the year. Nice. And the holidays. <laughs> and so I've dressed for it, as always. I, I do this for everyone. I love it. You know what it means. What does it mean? We really need to thank, from the bottom of our hearts, all of the people who have been listening and commenting to the podcast. So we have a gift for them. A gift? We do. What is it? We want to give them the gift of thinking. The gift of thinking. Which means there will be a special QR code and a discount code available to podcast viewers only, which gives them a significant discount yes. off of the Blue Belt course, which oh, is wow. a big course. Yeah, that is a big so course. they're going to save... A lot of money. And that's a great course that, that really, you'll develop really top-notch skills in that course. Well, So they can give it as a gift to, to anybody. You can share the discount code, share the QR code. We want to spread, spread the love of faking. Yeah.